All right. Well, thank you very much. We've got a really great panel that's ahead. This is a chance for us to explore one of the hottest topics I think that's going to be happening here at the AWS event this week, which is wrapped around the idea of protection, security, data management. It Everything that we do, we talk about data gravity, we talk about you know data latency, whatever the thing you say, data something. But in the end, data has a lot of properties that are valuable to the business. They affect the technology and all the processes wrapped around it. And on top of that, it affects a lot more because what we've got now is we hear more and more about ransomware. We hear more and more about the concept of immutable backups for other purposes other than just actual data, pure data protection, but actually doing live recovery for other development purposes. There really is this incredible opportunity ahead and so we're lucky because we are joined here by two fantastic folks here who are joining us from Cohesity. And uh, first of all, big shout out because thank you to the Cohesity team for being part of supporting uh, our community event here this week. And, and you folks are doing a lot. So with that, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll let you folks introduce yourself. So uh, we'll start with you, Jen. Lead us out. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, Jed Wallace. I'm a staff technologist with uh, Cohesity. I've uh, been here for a little bit and... Uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk uh, data protection. And the uh, the fun thing too, you're you're sort of fresh to the 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 Twitter verse and the social verse. Well, so we're breaking you into. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely the the noob. Oh, uh, we're throwing you in yeah, right into the fire here for yeah. it. I, I wouldn't have it any other way. No, <laughs> I'd throw me in the deep end. So. The the fun thing I want to do is we'll talk about a bit of your origin story too because that's actually very interesting in in the transition from Absolutely. being on the live customer side to you know, being on the other side of the, the desk, so to speak, where you're now taking what you learned in the field and being able to give that back in a broad set of customers, which is pretty cool. And I, I found it's like one of the most Absolutely. profound ways to, you when you're talking to customers, you get what they're living because quite often as tech vendors, and I lived this life for almost a decade, we just have this like, oh no, we're, you know, we're solving a complex problem. And it seems like the most important thing in the world. And that's because we sell one thing that does one thing. And that to us is the most important thing in the world, but realizing it's like one iota of the greater day-to-day -day ops. So there's a lot of neat things we can yeah, explore that, on that one. That, you, you bring up a good point because that perspective of literally just coming off of the, you know, the 24 seven administration and engineering side, uh, you know, that really does kind of, uh, it's got a, a nice broad reach to, to customers, you know, when you talk shop and everything, they, they re, you kind of understand where they're coming from because, you know, it hasn't been, 10 years, you know, since you actually, you know, we're in a data center racking and stacking servers and storage and all that good stuff, right? I'm so. getting nostalgia with that data center racking and stacking. I want to yeah, continue yeah. on with the introductions exactly. as we go on, but we're don't worry, we're going to reminisce yeah, about some absolutely. old times together. We'll be boss as well. <laughs> so also here we have Vic, but why don't you do an introduction? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks for having us, right? We're, we look forward to these things. Uh, you know, we're excited to be here. So uh, my name is Vic Camacho. I'm a principal technologist with Cohesity as well. And so uh, essentially, I'm a glorified speaker, <laughs> yeah. oh, right. glorified storyteller. He's a guy near and dear to our heart who's very experienced in all this podcasting and uh, you know, conversational side. And he's given us some tips and tricks. And, uh, you know, Eric, why don't you do your introduction? And then you know, we'll roll on and get get, get, get in. Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I have the joy sort of similar to Jed's story coming from the customer side. I worked for a couple of decades in in financial services, a systems architect, covered the gamut of stuff, and then got into working in the vendor space, worked with Turbonomic for, well, I worked, yeah, well, I worked for VM Turbo for three years, then I worked for Turbonomic for five years, then I worked for IBM for one year. Uh, funny, I never changed bosses, but uh, I, I worked at three different places uh, and then now I've launched uh, my own company, GTM Delta, which is kind of cool. So it's neat to have gone through that progression and then come out the other side and shot out into the independent world again, which is kind of neat. And of course, John, you, you and I uh, worked together for a minute, uh, you know, uh, uh, and we've done a lot of stuff collaborating here. So let's, uh, let's yeah. Go. So a quick introdu introduction, John Meyer, uh, Meyer Media, content uh, creator, the whole nine yards. And, you know, I think 
I'm part of the old school and I don't feel old, but I'm getting up there in age and that the nostalgia of talking about data centers and rack and stack. And I've worked in actually a web hosting company where we put the servers into the racks and all the networking on it. And I think that brings a broad experience of what we're going to talk about and how we're going to jump into things. And leading with that, I'm going to let you lead our conversation. Now, I'm going to start with you, Jed, because sort of carry on what we talked about the intro, the idea of the you know, lived experience. And we've seen a lot of changes in just data management. It's a weird thing, right? We talk about data management and it's hard to pin down what it means, but let's start there. Like sort of, first of all, actually, let me, at the very top, let's describe Cohesity. And I'd love to then fit stuff into kind of where you guys are, are solving a problem, but really let's, let's work from the data up and, and how people are using it. Well, I mean, from my experience, you know, well, we'll go ahead and we'll talk about Cohesity and what, what we do, you know, bringing all your workloads into one central location. That's, that's kind of, to me, that is the nutshell that is Cohesity, right? Because nice. no one else is really doing it. No one else is actually bringing all these different various workloads, no matter where their locale is, whether if it's uh, in the data center, whether it's in the cloud uh, or it's a remote site, um, we're going to bring it into one pane of glass. And it may sound simple to some people, but when you come from engineering and administration, it's a big deal, right? Because when you have all these different workloads and all these different areas, it's cumbersome to manage. You're you're wasting a lot of man hours on this. And uh, believe it or not, just coming off uh, less, not even a year uh, from the whole 24-7 <laughs> support roles, right? Um, Backup really is even in this this age of uh, ransomware and everything is 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 honestly still with a lot of customers a afterthought, right? And they don't understand that yes, backups are 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 not you know the sexiest thing, but it it's necessary, right? Because if you know if you're hit with a ransomware attack, you have to be able to recover. And with Cohesity, we can help people do that in a very, very efficient and quick manner. So, yeah, and just to dovetail off of that, I think, you know, it's a lot of this uh, isolated data, right? They have all these silos of data everywhere. And I think it just kind of crept up on everybody, right? Because you have workloads running everywhere now. And, you know, as an organization, if you're, you know, when you're on the other side, it just, it just kind of happens. So now you have, sometimes you don't even know that your teams are using various clouds. Right. Right. And yeah. so now, yeah. you know, you get hit with a bill and you're, or multiple you're like, bills or yeah. multiple bills. And you're, and now you're trying to figure out how we rein this all in. Right. There's the budgetary concerns. There's how do you manage data, uh, for especially sensitive data, regulatory kind of, uh, data that's uh, sensitive data in nature and under regulatory control. And so being able to use something like Cohesity or, or a system that allows you to bring it all into one to manage it, it's really important today. Uh, and, I think people are starting to realize that because audits happen, right? And if they can't oh, effectively, boy, <laughs> if, if if you can't effectively say, "Hey, we know where our data is at," and if you don't have some kind of classification or being able to classify that data, discover it, and then tag it, how do you protect it? Right? You can't protect what you don't know, and so that's kind of uh, kind of our wheelhouse now. We're trying to do that and, and trying to it, help customers manage a lot of that data now. Do you feel that uh, back then when you had your data centers, everybody understood where your data centers were at, right? You understood you had two data centers and you only had to worry about those. Now with the expansion of cloud and multi-cloud, now you have multiple data centers, multiple regions, which are considered data centers. It has grown that they don't understand where their data is actually residing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's, that's part of it, right? Because now you have things like GDPR, Right. Yeah. And putting your data in the cloud, it's going to get replicated to other locations just for fault tolerance purposes. You know, how do you how do you know where it's at? Can the cloud service provider give you that information? Maybe, maybe not. And so I think that's part of being able to understand where your data is at is, is step one. Protecting is step one, but understanding where it's at is is equally important because you have to be able to rein that all in in the case of a ransomware attack. And being able to, you know, or, or data exfiltration, even right. worse. So we have to be able to provide that for customers. Yeah. And I think you mentioning, I mean, a, a lot of customers, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing where they don't actually know where their data is at. Meaning, the, like Vic said, that sometimes they're not aware of, you know, I have a copy or a data set in, you know, 
uh, data center A, and then I have the same set in, say, S3 or something like that. And sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right is doing. And so I think with Cohesity, we kind of help eliminate that problem with those legacy solutions and kind of bring it into one, one platform. So it makes it easier to manage and actually see your data and, you know, how it's being, how it's being protected and how it's being used. Now, the one thing I, I, if we go now, that's the cool thing, because I, I think that gives a perfect staging of like, why does it matter to us that are data center operators, cloud operators, especially we're operating hybrid environments. That's just the reality of stuff. It's, it's not going anywhere, right? Whatever we want to call it. It's, it's definitely hybridity is, is the, is the new normal. And, you know, my other, I should have a bumper six as my other clouds, a hybrid cloud, you know, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's what we've got. And, and it will be for, you know, ad infinitum in effect, like even as we think we narrow down to one cloud, some other cloud's going to come along. And, you know, especially GDPR is interesting because more and more businesses are being affected by just consumer regulatory hit. And, you know, we used to call GDPR the gosh darn, well, we didn't use those words, but gosh darn, you know, privacy regulations, because it's really tough to manage. And then, if, you know, we had cookie apocalypse. We've got all these things that are trying to like slice down how we get access to data. And then underneath it, none of the systems were prepared for regulatory changes. And this is what we battle with all the time. But more than anything, just like day-to-day -day operations. We started off when we used to back up a system, it was a server. It was a virtual server. It had a web server, a database on it, maybe middleware, messaging, queue, something like that. But that didn't matter. That was transitory data that just, it's in flight, goes away, no big deal. But now that same server is now, it was virtualized. And then it was a two front end servers with a load balancer. And then it was a, a middle tier and then a back end tier. But now let's go into a database as a service that we've built ourselves, or that's going partly to the cloud and it's hanging off of something else. So the pattern, the fundamental patterns have changed. And, you know, given that your, your own background, you know, Jed, calling on your most recent, you know, shift into seeing both sides of it now, what was the progression you saw in just operational patterns for how you built applications? So I would kind of back up a little bit and, and, you know, coming back, coming off from uh, government, I came off of hardcore security in the last couple of years for election security, believe it or not. And believe it or not, a lot of the decisions that were driving backup, DR, you name it, was public perception. Right. So if you said, hey, um, you know, I want to put a copy of our data in the cloud, of course, you have to explain to people what the cloud is. And, <laughs> you know, it's just some magical word to some people that it's 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 your data some, living in the sky somewhere, you know, in Europe, they, they just don't know that it's just a data center um, <laughs> running servers and storage, and it's just in a different geographical uh, location. But I think the biggest issue was honestly perception. So it, it made the job difficult to, to kind of move to this, this hybrid scenario that we're actually talking about having our data, uh, you know, that three, two, one, having it, you know, having multiple copies in different geographical locations, um, was a hard sell because, you know, explaining to the public, you know, these are people are voters and, and ex, et cetera. Um, it's a difficult sell, you know, when you have to kind of get into the politics of things. And, and I, I came off of that and it, it, it did make the job a little more difficult these days because um, you have one side, everyone's like security, security, security. We have municipalities and, you know, clerk of courts and everything, you know, getting hit with ransomware. And they want you to respond, but then you got one hand tied behind your back because of perception. So it it's definitely a balance of, of, of you know, moving into this hybrid scenario where you can actually you can actually kind of manage, you know, uh, having your data in the cloud and on prem. So, so based on that, you we're we're effectively still in transition. We're going to be in transition for a long time, really. Absolutely, I mean, that's it's hard to imagine. You know, like we we keep saying it's we're here. You're like, no, 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 we're 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 we've got one toe in the water, basically. Yeah. So we would, you know, we with the, like the application side, we were, you know, getting rid of the whole traditional DMZ, right? Where, um. You know, you have that fi that physical segmentation, right? Say whether it's on a firewall or whether you're using NSX with micro segmentation. 
um, we started actually moving like anything that was a web front end. We would started we started moving to like AWS Elastic Beanstalk, and uh, so anything that was public facing would hit that. And you know, you had the it was scalable, you know, super redundant, um, and so uh, luckily it was kind of an easy sell. And you know, we we were kind of at the bleeding edge at my last job, and it was it was really nice to kind of move away. From from some of those leggy, legacy, you know, scenarios like DMZs and everything, you get like the web front up there, you have load balancer, it's scalable, it'll spin up depending on, you know, what, you know, what resource usage it is. And uh, the developers got used to it, which was great. And, um, and all you were really responsible for was backing up the the database on the back end, right? Yeah. And it was it was kind of almost uh, just throw away servers, right? You know, just <laughs> spin them up, spin them down. And uh, I don't know, it was really nice. What's know. curious too, and what you bring up is the idea that we probably still observe a lot of patterns that we had before. Like I remember when we virtualized firewalls and we had a virtual, we had, I'd virtualized my server environment and then we had virtualized firewalls. And <laughs> then we had virtualized the DMZ inside the virtual networking and the virtual server. But yet I was still asked to set up a three node cluster purely for dmz hosts i'm like you yeah. all know that this is going through the same physical wire to the top of rack switch that's like, right. like there's vlans yeah. that's what's actually protecting us but yet we were still being asked to like put it in a box and by being in a separate rack in a separate virtual server with yep. the same back-end networking it was this perception of safety i think you just touched on that as the perception of safety the perception that we all once had that things are still operating in the same way in the same methodology that they used to be right so nothing has progressed uh you know some of us have progressed right you know, we, we've adopted the cloud we understand the cloud we know that it's here to stay right we're not afraid to kind of move to our where the education of those who you know, are used to things the way they were and they, you know, they want to keep doing that and they want to understand it. I think you touched on it for the developers going with Elastic Beanstalk is that they realize that this is freaking cool. Like we're, this is going to work for us. We need to That's start right. doing the rest of this. Vic, are you seeing the same thing? Like, you know, kind of progressing forward with them in the education model that understanding cloud is the value there's a lot of value there yeah i think so i mean, it, I mean we've been talking about at least for those of us that have been in the vendor space we've been talking about cloud for years now right 2008 2010 time frame we understood it was going to take some time to get there right just like virtualization yeah right it took time to finally get people to buy into it le it leadership to buy into it it's the same with cloud. Uh, and the way I would explain it is, you know, do you use Gmail today? Well, that, your email's in the cloud. You know, do you use O365? That's in the cloud. Um, so there's still a transition. We're never going to, I don't think we'll ever get to just complete cloud, right? All workloads in the cloud. I think new companies will because it's uh, a little co more cost effective for them until they get to scale. And then they have to start to, uh, thinking about, well, do we bring some of this back on-prem and keep some in the cloud where it makes sense? I think that's what we're going to have. I, I don't think we're going to get away from uh, the hybridity of it. I think it's always going to be some kind of hybrid environment. Um, but I think the acceptance is there more. They're seeing the value. You're never going to beat a hyperscaler in being able to scale up and scale down as yeah. you need. You can't do that with your on-premises environment. So there are some pros and cons there. Uh, but I think to that to that degree, it's going to be, you know, the older legacy organizations out there have started to adopt it, just not as not as frequently as the newer upstart companies that are coming out because they understand it I, right up the bat and they can start from scratch and, and they don't have this large migration of data that they have to do. How are you approaching customers that are either already fully in the cloud hybrid or thinking about either both or whatever it is from a cohesity standpoint, right? You, you, you enter somebody and they're like, Hey, listen, we're worried about our stuff. Okay. So what does that really mean? Or, or, or we want to protect our stuff. Uh, how do I visualize my stuff? I've got multiple regions or I've got multiple data centers, but how are you kind of approaching that from a scenario portion where customers still want to move from their data center to the cloud? Well, I mean, we can help migrate some of that, right? Because we already work with AWS today, right? We can help protect those some of those workloads, uh, like the RDS, 
you know, C2, yeah. C2, you know, and so we can, um, we can do those things today. So if they are looking to migrate some of that stuff over, it's really easy, right? It's just being able to see it with a cohesity system and then just help migrate some of that over. So that part of it's already there. Uh, I don't know if, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know which, who we'd work with uh, in that regard, but we support the cloud today, right? So right. Uh, it's an easy, it's an easy migration effort. It's yeah. time consuming, you have to plan for it, but uh, the, the steps are pretty uh, well laid out now. Yeah, because you can back up existing workflows and then you can relocate them into the cloud, right? Coecity kind of really does a good job of that, so. And, and the good thing is it, as we see, sorry, we just lost our, our network for a moment there. As we see the patterns changing of the way that applications are being built, the good news is it allows us to revisit and get, like the developers tend to have to approach the ops team and say like, hey, we need a new server. We're, we're using a new service. They're asking for firewall rules. They're asking for different types of connectivity. And that allows us to be like, oh, oh, why are you doing that? And now you're kind of going back to the requirements phase again with stuff. Because we've had these workloads that live for so long and then we moved them around, we virtualized them. And then that was it. They just kind of like, they just moved around on the plate. Same number of cookies, but right. you know, we just moved them around on the plate. And, but now it's new plates, new cookies, totally fundamental pattern shift. And it gives us a chance to say like, all right, let's go back to the drawing board on how we build an operational pattern now to like manage that the data life cycle, the application life cycle, because now this problem, the data life cycle doesn't match the application anymore. It used to be you'd protect a server, something goes sideways, restore the server, whammo, state zero, done. But now you're like, oh, I have a five tiered application, right? It's got three levels of, you know, mid tier key value stores and all this stuff. And like, so if I snap seven servers, how do I understand application consistency and application state if I don't even understand how it is. So we now have to like talk to the developers, figure out what the patterns are. And then when we recover an application, which is what we're really recovering, way different. So it's, you know, operationally, like, you know, again, like how does that look in your people you're talking to? Are you seeing more people that are like moving to these distributed application patterns? Um, I can speak for myself. Um, being that I just kind of, you know, like I said, re to just reiterate, I, I'm coming, <laughs> just coming off the engineering and, and administration side. Um, so, you know, I bring it back to perspective, you know, uh, we have a data set, you know, and there's say there's PII in there and everything. And so they don't want that data in the cloud. So you end up with your SQL databases on premise, and then we have the front end or the application side in AWS. So um, you'll see some places like us at one time, of course, where you're using two, two different backup products to back up the cloud portion. And then you're using another backup product to back on, you know, back up the on-prem and which kind of leads us into, you know, what Coecity does is, is bring those workloads into one place. I know we're, we're kind of, you know, going to beat that drum a lot, I think, but, you know, I think it's worth saying so. Well, and I mean, that in effect is the pattern that we need to follow is, you know, like I think of it as like the application versus the infrastructure. But if we actually play it out to its logical conclusion, it means we have to have one single place in which we can go to understand the state of all parts of the environment. That's right. Yep. Including data lifecycle, including application placement, including, you know, data placement. There's so many moving parts. And, and the only way you can understand that state is to have one central place in which you can go to that has an awareness of where this stuff lives. And, and there's, there's inefficiencies when, when you, when, you know, when you kind of bring it back to the DevOps world, there's inefficiencies, uh, about actually, you know, kind of getting the, the most value for that data. I know that might sound a little markety, but, um, <laughs> sorry, I've, I've worked in marketing a long time. It's a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, you know, I'm an engineer, I'm not a marketing person, but, you know, working the last six years was, was mainly in DevOps slash, you know, security, because I mean, you get thrown into that, especially when you work in elections, um, was working with these, with these people to, you know, kind of redefine how they do things. Right. So, I mean, I don't know what your experience is with that, Vic. 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, to Eric, to, to Eric's point, right. Having a, a single platform or a, at least a unified view of everything, right. Not to, not to say the single pane of glass, but that's exactly what it is, right? right. It's just one place where you can see all your data, having all those workloads, um, under one platform so that you know where everything is at, being able to back up to the cloud, being able to protect workloads that are living on, on prem. Uh, I think that's what you're going to need and being able to protect the workloads and being able to secure the workloads as well. Um, it, it, it's, it's one of those value adds that you can't live without today. Given today's threat landscape, you have to be able to secure the data. And, you know, I, I've, I spent three years over at high trust, which was just deep cybersecurity. So, um, I know for those of us that are on this side of the fence, it's very normal to us. We can have these conversations, but for someone that's in the customer space, it's a little more difficult because that's not their, that's not what they do day to day. And right. so it's our job to help them understand that. And having that platform is going to uh, help simplify a lot of those things for IT leaders and IT practitioners alike. So Vic, uh, Eric touched on it a little bit for the data lifecycle policies and coming from their traditional data center background. Man, I feel a little nostalgic every time. I say that. Thank you, Chad, for bringing back. You call it nostalgia. I call it PTSD. <laughs> well, hey, what are you doing afterwards? I'm sure they're going to need a couple, right? So talking about those and defining those workloads that you're backing up, do you remember back then? And everybody did a different method. Okay, so this is a platinum level, level and we did a gold, bronze, you know, and silver, and then, you know, who whatever or whatever is left or t-shirt sizes mm -hmm. and i defined my backup strategy based off of these oh this application is platinum we need to back it up every hour on the hour and then uh, how easy is it to define this and to be actual have a clear view of these types of application or is everybody in the same type of spectrum like we're doing everybody because the cost is the same no matter what well i mean the cost may not be the same right but you know how much storage do you have you know all those questions start to come into play but it's being able to identify what kind of workloads you have some are going to be mission critical some are not uh and so you know for those policies like gold policies right um you're going to want your mission critical data there for those that may not have stringent requirements or may not have as sensitive data you want to maybe use a silver policy for that but being able to understand what kind of data you have by classification, right? And tagging the data and then moving it to a more secure location, right? And creating those trusted, uh, I, I call them a trusted zone versus an untrusted zone where you can get more granular controls over it is gonna be very helpful. So you can still do that. It's very easy. It's very easy to define with, within the Cohesity system already. So it's not a very difficult thing. To is do. that still the right methodology to do or, uh, you know, kind of, way to handle things or has that changed because granted that's the old way we used to do things right you know you you would define it and i i won't name some platforms that we utilize for it but like oh you went on this node versus this node handled your traffic and these are the old data center things is there a new way that you think that we should define those or look at some of those in the cloud or hybrid thing? i think in, in in years past i think it mattered more just because you know it, it seemed like Every year there was a vendor that was just increasing their speed, right? Compute your know, feeds and speeds. And today everything is fast. So it doesn't really matter as much. I think it's there as part of the old, you know, mentality. So I don't I think that's gonna exist for some time. But just to help us old folks still have Yeah, for those of us that are north of fifty, yeah. maybe. <laughs> well but, we, we had this funny thing we uh, I my favorite saying is, you know. You call it legacy. I call it production. Like we, <laughs> we've been, do, we really have this unfortunate thing. And like single pane of glass, we've made it a bit of a dirty word. It's a pejorative in tech, especially in the vendor space. We kind of chuckle like, ah, I used to single pane of glass. But it, it's more like a common gateway by which we manage a thing. You know, it's a single good. pane of glass sounds very, you know, like it's one, you know, it's one sort of super portal, like a CRM thing you'd have. But really what it is, is more than just visibility. It's a control point. There are other systems will consume the systems. It's like the API thing. It's like, I would ask every vendor that would come into my, you know, to tell me about their platform. I would ask them, do you have, you know, a, a fully publicly available RESTful API and f where it's fully documented? I was never going to be sitting there, you know, carving out API calls. But no. what I want, what I wanted to know was they were thinking about this as a manageability feature so that when other adjacent platforms started to tap into the service, 
we have API driven methods by which we can access and manage the content that's managed by this adjacent system. I, I think that's where one place where Cohesity definitely excels is with our marketplace, right? And it's it's all API driven and you know all the partnerships we've we've made over you know the past several years uh, to me is pretty impressive, right? Yes, I have uh, I've officially drunk the Kool Aid, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's for a good reason though, because I mean, uh, you know, I think Vic was talking about in his uh, one of his presentations today, um, you know, and you know I won't name any names, but basically, you know, trying to bring the security team and the admin team and the dev teams kind of together, um, and you might ha already have some kind of existing platform are, uh, you know, for security and, you know, doing, you know, investigations and all that kind of stuff when it comes to ransomware and having that, having that to be able, you know, having that integration with our product and having all this, you know, all the big players, you know, as uh, partners, I think it really gives you bringing it back to added value to your data. And, you know, I was drawing a blank earlier, you know, when I started talking about DevOps is that the getting your bang for the buck, uh, I think, is 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 really something where we also excel because you can yes it could be difficult to get the the devs to kind of do things a different way a more efficient way because you know um they're so used to doing it a certain way even though to me or to maybe you, you it might be inefficient where you can actually instead of you know spinning up a new vm in a lower environment with a copy of a database from production blah 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 they wouldn't run queries against it this that and the other um, you could just do that from your your existing you know backup data, and so you're getting more value and uh, use out of it as opposed to just hey, this is my backup data. It's there. I feel protected, right? You're actually yeah. doing something with it, and you know as well as analytics and you know and again the marketplace and all that other stuff. So you can actually see what's happening with your data, especially in that security space, right? Well, we're definitely an, an open uh, an API first driven organization, right? So we do just. To, to talk about a little bit what Jed was mentioning is being able to partner or integrate, you know, third party integration with, you know, security partners that are that's 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 in their wheelhouse. So why would we try to reinvent the wheel? Right. Yeah. Let's absolutely. partner with these folks, get your IT ops and your sec ops to be able to work more closely together. Oftentimes, your incident response teams dev are uh, your security operations teams. They have their own set of tools. IT ops has their own set of tools and there's a lot of overlap there, but they don't know what, he, what they're doing, right? What each other's doing. And when you have that integration, they can work a little more closely together. You can have your security operations folks kick off a job from their systems that actually tie in with our system at Cohesity and kick off a, a instant mass recovery as an example. So that you can recover in, in mass, right? And this is really just to satisfy business continuity requirements, right? Yeah. And move at the speed of their own SLAs. So you don't, you know, if you can, when you have that collaboration, then it's a little easier. Everybody knows what, you know, they're doing and you have that, that, um, the color, essentially the collaboration going there. Yeah. It's, it's bringing it back to the left hand knowing what the right hand's doing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. that's, that's not always the case. Well, so. even just the fact that we had to call this practice dev sec ops and people are like, why do we have to say sec in the middle? I'm like, because we didn't invite them to the requirements discussion. Right. Like we, we really have, but the interesting thing i think is that we developed operational patterns like you know the concept of you know instant immutable backups that we could then use for you know development purposes or it was for like snap recoveries or quick storage for like intraday snapshots and you know i know snapshots are not backups whatever it means but just as a general way like a, a general protection point at which you could quickly roll back to and what was funny or ironic or you know peculiar whatever it was that we were suddenly opening the door to a security pattern that when we saw ransomware become you know a thing i was like oh wait a second this the same practice we've got where like rapid immutable you know snaps could give us a, a point where we can capture something that's happening on the fly for investigation we could stop something we could detect a pattern but because we built the framework to do this, because you've designed the system to be able to be like, I can just run this command and immediately that's it. Everything in my entire, this section is now immutable. Then you're instantly protected. You have a rollback point to previous, you know, incremental, whatever it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But what started off as a, like, how do I protect my intraday backups? All of a sudden you're like, ooh, if I use the same idea, I can programmatically trigger 
So maybe you've got like a security partner and they said, hey, we've detected inbound a ransomware detection. And then that platform via the marketplace could be like, all right, whoosh, snap it all. And that's, it's funny that we accidentally discovered this great recovery pattern. And, uh, you know, I think that's the right. Snap it all. And, <laughs> exactly. And yeah. Lock all the backups. Nobody touches yeah, yeah. anything because that's the first thing they're going for with it. Yeah, I mean, I think the immutable, you know, the, the immutability is great, right? Being able to sandbox that off then and being able to do forensics on it is key. Uh, I, I think most security operations want to do forensics on, you know, the ransomware or whatever breach happened. Being able to cordon that off with immutability so that they're still protected it is a good thing to have, right? I think most security operations today want to do some type of forensics and not just delete something and then move on. They, they you know, they, they need to understand how it happened, why it happened, when it happened, who made it happen, uh, and so having that capability is is a uh, is a good thing to have. Yeah, I mean, you 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 see all the big players, you know, rushing to put in uh, virus and what malware scanning when you do backups, right? And uh, it's it's. Uh, it's definitely about you know playing keep up. So as far as technology and keeping your data secure, so well, and, and I, I, what I really like is that the team and the platform approach is like if you go back to like the first appearance in the market, it's always funny. If there's like the go to market, the first thing you have is like obviously like backup. Sometimes they're appliance based, then they become software based, and and when you really read into it, if you went to sort of the ethos of the way the platform was was developed and designed, you're like, oh yeah, like we're finally now, however many years in, reaching what what the founders wrote however many years ago. It takes a long time because you have to first you have to sell a thing, you have to develop and market, and then you sort of kind of grow into your pants of, of <laughs> metamorphosis. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's nice to see that it play out. And looking back at the early phase of how it, it there's a lot of also rands in the market, in, in, in any market. I'm not calling out you yeah. know, this in, in particular, but it's just, we have this, we ransomware becomes a thing, you know? And so all of a sudden, everybody's a ransomware protection product. And you're like, well, but was the platform designed in its core to handle this kind of thing. It just so happens that this is a fantastic use case yeah. versus like, oh, I'm going to just start putting ransomwares and, you know, and just for the record, no hackers <laughs> sit there with one hand and a hoodie, you know, <laughs> like that's that same like stupid stock footage we use for the secure, you know, like, you know, I love that stock footage. I actually <laughs> use some Instagram. I'm not using it anymore anyway. <laughs> I, I think, you know, one thing that I, I, was used to was, um, you know, again, won't mention any vendors, but you know, they would just, as opposed to working and, you know, to have partnerships and, and, you know, bringing those APIs to work together, um, they would just make acquisitions. Right. And as opposed to, you know, I'm not used, to, I wasn't used to the model that CoECD kind of, you know, you know, brought to me. Um, I was always used to, Hey, uh, this vendor bought, you know, these, X, Y, and Z startups to, you know, kind of just make their code mesh together, which only, you know, turns into some kind of Frankenstein as opposed to, you yeah. know, where to me, it's a lot more thoughtful when you're working with these partners and, you know, we're both getting something out of this partnership. Right. So, um, I would say we're also getting some, a little more eloquent, you know, eloquent, uh, as far as, you know, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a whole, you know, acquiring a company and making it mesh and sometimes it's a necessity, right? I mean, some organizations that's not in their wheelhouse. And so they, they acquire something they can't, if they do have it, then they're going to code it I mean, you know, they'll code for it and build it all in. I think Cohesity has done a, a pretty good job at creating a lot of that, right? Um, you know, Mohit Aaron being the founder and bringing that, all that experience he had from Google, right? Yeah. So, uh, kind of building the same platform in, in that manner be, so that everything can run on it. Like Google can run YouTube, it can run Gmail, all those things. You know, you know we're trying to do the same thing at Cohesity. He's, and I think you, you're seeing the fruition of that now. It, it, it feels like, uh, you know, they say it takes a village, right? And that's what this feels like to me, as opposed to bringing it back to where, you know, we're a multi-billion dollar company, not Cohesity, I'm not talking about that. I'm <laughs> talking about, you know, other companies, and just kind of, you know, taking, you know, getting these little guys, taking what we need from them and uh, kind of meshing our stuff together. It, it It's kind of odd to me, and I, I'm still surprised by it. You know, it, it's just like, 
seeing companies work together, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. it, it's not something I've been, that I'm used to, right? That's not something that I've had a, a lot of experience with. So it's, it's actually kind of refreshing, honestly. So now let's talk about the, you know, we, we hinted to it before we've all talked about sort of the unsexiness uh, of, of what we do, like, you know, that's why the, they talk about the new kingmakers. It's not about the the fine folks in operations that are backing <laughs> your data up. It's it's always about some some kid in a hoodie that just developed a new <laughs> application that's going to take the world by storm. But yet, this is this is it's oxygen. We, we I'd always used to talk in disaster recovery of like an oxygen services, and people are like, "Why do you?" What do you mean by I'm like Active Directory? Simple things like how do you just get the lights on to start with? This is the baseliner. Everything reboots. Okay, let's make sure the hull of the ship is solid. Perfect. Get the base lights on. Start the engines. Like that's it's it's unsexy, but you know <laughs> until you need to recover, and then it becomes the sexiest thing you need. <laughs> but it's the last thing that I think people approach is the recovery aspect. They're like, yeah, I got all my backups. I got all this stuff ready to go. Right? I I, I know it works. You know what? We don't need to test it. Right? And then all of a sudden, oh, that's they, the worst thing they ever. Have to, they yeah, have that's to, right. seriously. We, we don't need to test recoveries at all, right? But you just feel <laughs> happy and secure. Listen, I click the backup thing; it works, right? And, yeah. and when it comes time to it, what happens? You spend a week trying to recover that one file and realize I should have tested it, this out. I should have <laughs> went through my process. This should have been it. Should have been a click of a button and restore. But they didn't really realize the whole process behind it and the whole thing that it took to actually do the steps that they thought they could do with one click. You know? Yeah. Is it, is it, you know, is it just a snapshot or does it have granular recovery, right? Whether it's a file server, education know. on what they're backing. That's up. right. I mean, yeah. If it's just a windows file server and you're just doing a regular snapshot, well, you're not, you know, it makes it a little more difficult to kind of reach in and just get that one little needle in that haystack that you grab need. it, mount it, pull it out. That's right. Dry, yeah. And now I just restored 10, thousand gigabytes of data That's for right. this <laughs> one megabyte of file That's right but don't worry i got back your excel spreadsheet <laughs> unfortunately that's kind of still how it goes for a lot of companies so uh i can attest that out for sure so you're right you need to test your backups thoroughly you need to you know you need to get on on a schedule quarterly monthly whatever it is you know depending on the criticality of your application and the data that you know you're housing so Bill Belichick would have said, do your job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so now we're quoting now. Well, all right. I, <laughs> I, I know that intimately because I've given that I work for a Boston-based company. And, and, of course, in the proper way, it's like, do your job. <laughs> it's always got to sound like, much better. like John F. Kennedy said it. Go pack your car. But it's, it, yeah, you lost me on the sport analogy. <laughs> if it's not uh, like Gryffindor or Hufflepuff, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm All right. I, okay, I'm yeah. good, but. Well, uh, let's say if you're not slithering, you better be slithering out. <laughs> <laughs> if that, that's the only house that matters. Yeah, right. Right. You know, I mean, take your Hufflepuff body out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no muggles allowed. Yes, uh, yes, there you go. <laughs> here we go. Well, alrighty then. <laughs> <laughs> we just uh, went into a rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what are we talking about? All right, so, cool. <laughs> but business business continuity, I think, is the that's really what we're after. We we talk like that's backups. Right. Unfortunately, have this like again, it's like almost like a pejorative, like oh backups. But you know, it's business recovery, it's business continuity, and we even used to stop saying disaster recovery mostly because like it it sounded kind of gross <laughs> and it, it had a very negative connotation. It, but business continuity is how do we deal with various levels disaster recovery sort of had this assumption that all right whoosh, gone. here comes the hurricane right, right something that was major but business continuity is a continuous multi-tiered multi-leveled kind of yeah. recovery process mm -hmm. right it, it is you know and, and i think dr disaster recovery is just one part of that right there's all this documentation and processes that have to be put in place your run books uh, run books yeah but you know i mean it's it's understanding you know business continuity as a whole and and for for organizations, that's really what it's about, right? Being able to continue business operations. Some small to medium sized SMBs, you know, if, if they're down for three four days, some some of these folks have to shut their doors, never to open again. So it becomes, you know, uh, you know, for those type of organizations, it, it's of paramount, you know, importance because business continuity is their life's blood, and so they have to be able to continue. But that you know you make a good point eric and and the idea that it's it's a very human driven like we all like 
and it's software that manages it. It's software that controls it. But if you don't have the like human driven policies to manage it, like in the end, you know, like I said, it was run books and we all like, we all laughed so hard at that because I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I know that one. It, well, your run book, which was electronic then printed with a post-it note and then a Sharpie over the, you know, <laughs> step three and make sure you do this twice because it doesn't work every time. Like, those run books when we put those into platform into that entry gateway that one common gateway in which we manage data as a as a unit you know across every plat every part of the environment that's the goal like how do we take human processes render them in software process and then there's still a human decision i mean as much as I automated business continuity with multiple platforms over the decades I've been working, as you can tell by the frown lines and, and, <laughs> and gray hairs, when it all came down to it, something goes completely sideways. And if automation was really driving, it'd be like, all right, flip it all over. And in the end, you're like, no, no, no. Like we always say four hour recovery, but what if it's four hours and 10 minutes? Do you really fail over the entire data center at four hours? Or do you like, you make a human decision? So we really still have to have like one click capabilities, but that we can interact with through other systems. You can automate until the cows come home, but there's always going to be an element of manual process just for that peace of mind. You know, is this really going to go the way I think it's going to go? Right. You can, you can write it down and wish for the best, but you know, you need to, you need to approach it in a way where you, you definitely test it and make sure it works and, you know, I think you're touching on that it explicitly is talking about that manual process. Think about how we define the data life cycle for like those platinum or gold level servers. Right. Right. This high end application. Am I going to want it to be automatically failed over and restored? Or do I want a human just saying, eh, eh, I'm not sure. Wait, let's restore it over here and test it out real quick before we do it, because they didn't test it ahead of time. But you just don't want to. Well, we're going to touch on the whole business continuity, DR, and, you know, actually restoring a file and what's the value of it because people need to be educated on that. But do you really enact a manual restore and then, oh, my God, it restored everything and I only wanted one file, right? Yeah, you, you definitely need, you need to be mindful. That's really all I could say on that. So it it needs a conversation. It does. Every single piece of application that you're doing, you know, below a certain level needs a conversation on the level of human interaction and automation implied into it. I mean, it, it, you know, it really does come back to just education, you know, knowing your environment, knowing your data, knowing where it's at, what it's doing. I think that's really the first step, right, is is just knowing and having an education about your data what it's doing and how are you going to recover, you know, and do you want this fully automated stuff can definitely go wrong when you fully automate, well, yeah, you know, failover and things like that. Yeah. It's understanding, right. It's awareness. Uh, I, I, you can't automate everything out. There's just no way, right. There's, you know, even automation can have errors in it, right. Cause we're, we're prone to error, but to what you to just to what you were saying, Jed, it's really about understanding what kind of data you have, where it's at, I keep coming back to that. And, and also which in which data is actually critical, right? Everybody thinks they're data. It's all my, my dev application as legacy hanging on with a single server is very critical that I meet up all the time. A H HR and accounting's 80 gig Excel file that, that they should have a SQL database for. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a common one on my desktop. Yeah, that's no right. Less, right? That's my desktop. So we don't do Roman profiles <laughs> anymore because user XYZ has got an 80 gig desktop loading. Right. So, and we used to have this, wow. I, I always love when you do business continuity and you have to assign a, a cost or a price to it. Cause I did internal like funny money chargeback for the services and people would say like, oh, you know, what tier is your application? Like, oh yeah, it's tier one. And you're like, <laughs> okay, cool. And like, well, yeah. Because it would be based on an RPO and RTO settings, and then based on that, and then you would say, okay, well, then it's going to cost this much to manage the application. Like, I, I, let's go with tier two. And you're like, okay, but like, was it tier two because you don't want to pay for it? Or is it tier two because as a business rule, you can get away with it? And they'd say, well, we at tier two, you're allowed eight hours of downtime. And I'm like, okay, 
but what if the eight hours is say Monday, 8 a.m. until Monday, you know, 5 p.m.? And they're like, oh, no, 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 that, that can't be. I'm like, it's tier one then. But <laughs> we we're fighting with like cost of operations. It's a real set of trade offs, right? Cost is a huge deal because, you know, say in the DevOps world, right, you always have multiple environments, right? You have your lower environments, you know, that, you know, the application needs to go through, you know, dev test, staging, and then production, right? And then, a lot of times with staging and production, you like those to be identical. And so they want to treat that staging environment, which there is a cost, right? The the disk space, the the you know, the the hosts and everything like that. It costs money. So you're you're duplicating the cost of staging that you want to be exactly like production and you want to treat it like tier one. I mean, there are these like you said, there's these trade-offs. You gotta, you know, a lot of times they need to understand that, you know, the the bucket has a bottom, right? It's yeah. not, it's that, there's not, there's not this, you know, pit of money that we could just grab and be like, Hey, all your low environments, we treat them like production. No problem. Oh, you it's know. all, money, it's all important. Yeah. It's all money, important until they see the cost. I, I think yeah. it's back to the education that we're talking about right. is that the developers and the application owners who are handling this stuff where they think, you know, obviously the application, their application is the only thing they're concerned about. They are tier one no matter what, but they don't realize that there's a cost associated that trickles down to the entire company and understanding the value of, hey, listen, you're going to have two hours of downtime. No, no, it can't happen. I need a rapid response. Do you know this is an environment that I've really analyzed that you only use for one hour a week? Yep. Well, I need it for that one hour. Okay, but uh, the cost that you're doing it, and it's the education, the conversation that's solely around it. Eric, you've touched on it, is that everything that we're talking about here drives around the cost of what their application is going to do. What what kind of backups, what kind of retention, what kind of uh, RPO, RTO that they want tied to this application. And the conversation that we're having is the cost associated with it. They're like, well, I'm not paying the bill. I'm, I'm not worried about it. But in the end, everybody is associated to it. When there's cost beyond just like raw dollar cost, like that's obviously huge. But by trying to get around that, raw dollar cost, we often make performance trade-offs. So we make, we use other methods. And I mean, I always think of like sort of like that Anakin meme where it's like, you know, you, you did this thing, right? And like, and like, right. You know, like, and it's, they'll say like, you know, I, yeah, I've been taking snapshots every, you know, five hours for safety. And they said, oh, you get rid of the interim snapshots though, right? You get rid of the interim snapshots, right? Because what happens all of a sudden, you look at like, why do we have four terabytes for this web server? Well, oh, because I'm taking snapshots every hour and never getting rid of the old ones. So it's like these continuous iterative, we're trying to cheat the system, but never going back to like, what's the first principles? What are we actually trying to do? And because the performance trade-offs are disturbing and just the capacity trade-offs and like it's a huge risk and time and time again we like let's take a snapshot and snapshots are not backups but like even as a protective mechanism for operations upgrades if we don't go back and check where that is and we like move it to another data center put it in another region whatever just for like we're doing an upgrade and we forget and that's why again like this idea of like one one portal, you know, one, you know, for you know, one common pain. He's of- trying not to yeah. use the word <laughs> in this conversation. You you end up having uh, <laughs> 40 terabytes of staging data in uh, AWS 3 that it's been there for nine months. And then the, you know, when somebody says, what is this bill? It's not going to go to the developer. It's going to go to the engineer and the administrator, you know, from the exec to us. Uh, directly and they're going to ask those questions you know the dev the dev world i love them they're needed obviously but sometimes there's that disconnect between you know what is doable (laughs) you know so um, like you said there's always a cost attributed to all these things and it's our jobs as engineers and administrators to to take in security and costs into everything we do so I call those breadcrumbs, but those are expensive breadcrumbs. They are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's a, that's a good analogy for it because I, I think w- what happened when we were in the data center, and yes, I keep coming back to that. Thank you, Jed. Uh, is, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go hug one after this. <laughs> but I think we keep coming back to it is that they never had to worry about the cost because it was associated over a five-year term, right? I bought this, this data's here, and I have to expand it. But now it's back into the developers and the engineers' hands 
for the cost to make sure that when they set this, I mean, I, I love the, uh, you know, for 4,000 terabytes, 4, terabytes worth of web server data that I'm holding for the lifelong that it's been up for the last six years is that now you have to realize and visualize that I said this, I feel so great. I've got five hours, every five hours I got the snapshot, but you haven't deleted it. Oh, I know I might need six years worth of data, but there's no retention policy that needs that. Yeah. So understanding what you're doing to save these backups, but the retention now comes along with the education and that you need to clean things up. Yes, the cloud is huge. We can store massive amounts of data, but do you really? No. Yeah. And I, I always ask, I always ask like, well, where are you getting that retention number from it? What's the requirement? Right? I forgot yeah. to click the button. <laughs> I think, I think the word that, you know, I don't hear a lot, which we should is, is sprawl. I mean, when you have, da when you have data sets or copies of data sets, you know, it's exact same data sets and you have it at multiple locations and then you just forget about it. And then guess what? Some, 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 Joe Schmo in accounting is just paying the bill, right? So as opposed to knowing what data you have and where it's at and saving your company or organization thousands of dollars in, uh, say, cloud costs uh, or storage, you know, they just keep paying the bill. And I've seen it before, and that's why I bring it up. So, you know, again, education, know, knowing what you have and where you have it and, um, you know, kind of getting into that data sprawl, right? So, and bring it back to cohesity and taking advantage of your data can, it can save you a lot in cost because you're just using data that you already have, right? You're just making, you know, you're just adding value to that data and you're just reusing it and, you know, it's and, just, and you're moving your policies into, into that, that same platform, that's right. not just about visibility, but truly about management, which I think is what we've, we see backup as just like, eh, it's a thing that goes on and, and like the we talk about visibility. Visibility is incredibly important, but visibility without an actionable way in which you can interact with it, it's kind of pointless, right? I could have, you know, one spreadsheet that pulls all this data into one spot, but if I can't interact with it, I, it's just any platform is like that. So giving visibility, yeah. well, I could open up, I could put one monitor and just put four windows on it. I got one for this cloud, one for this cloud, one for this cloud, one for my data center. Great, I've got visibility. You All know, right. that is a single pane of glass, by the way. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, but something something goes wrong. Well, now what do I do? Well, I have to go to four places to do something about it. And that's the and that's the pattern change. And, and we're not talking about a small chunk of change when we're talking about low environments, because a lot of times, yes, they have to be identical to production. And, you know, what I'm trying to get at is that with, with you know, obviously using Cohesity, you can, I would like to get the DevOps world to where they're kind of eliminating these lower environments and making use of the data they already have that's being backed up, right? Um, you know, not only is it more efficient, it's safer, you know, and um, you're saving a lot of money. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in, you know, uh, compute resources and storage, you know, and and reining that in, I think it could save people a lot of money, you know, so. And it, is it a, it's a chance for us to go again back to first principles of like, what is it you're trying to achieve by the way you're doing this today? Are yeah. you like you have five environments? Why do you have five environments? Like, oh, because I have to do canary deployments and I'm doing like we're getting smart. We're doing DevOps. We're doing blue greens and, you know, all this, you know, OK, that's great. But, you know, we've got a better way you could do that. And that I think this is where we're we're a few years out of complete adoption of it but we have to kind of go back and like knock on the door like you know there's programmatic ways that we can deliver this to you instead of you having to like slice a hunk of data copy it over here and they've got all these goofy pearl scripts running somewhere just because that's they've got a library of that you know somewhere i mean what about yeah. the human element right i mean that's that's another cost we don't talk about is that the people who have to manage this sprawl you know the, all these eight different environments and, you know, four different data centers, you know, where you can actually rein that in into one platform and you're saving money on, on, you know, uh, you know, the human element, you know, people. Yeah. I mean, I think the question has to be asked, like, what is the requirement? Why are we doing this? Right. I, I think, uh, at least, you know, I'm putting my consulting hat back on. Yeah. The first thing I like, well, it depends. What are you trying to do? What's the requirement? Uh, a lot of time they have, uh, lofty goals, and without understanding what the business requirement is and based off the business requirement, that'll predicate what the 
technical use cases become. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the elements, right? Again, education and awareness. Uh, and so that's where I always start with, and that's where I always kind of my, my go-to, like, why do we need this? And, and if, yeah, especially if, if you've got that idea, they'll say like, well, why do you, why do you take, you know, snapshots every 30 minutes? Well, because my recovery point has to be every 30 minutes. So like, but you know that this system gets data dropped into it from another system that actually has the data. This is actually a dump spot for read only data that's coming from somewhere else. Why are you snapshotting read only data that's already existing yep. in another place? Elsewhere. And I think that's, again, like we go back to put that hat on of go to requirements, go to first principles. What are we trying to achieve? Because if we don't keep revisiting the stuff, it's, it's easy for them. And to think that they're stuck as, a, as an application builder, I'm like, I have to build this logic into my code, into the way that I build my app. They don't realize that there's so many better ways that we can interact with them on the ops sides to you know, give them what they actually need. Vic is talking about it, and uh, you guys have mentioned it a bunch of times. In fact, you know, asking the requirements, to not just jumping in there, yeah, we can handle it, let's just do it, but really understanding the customer aspect and what they're trying to achieve. Don't just implement something and say, yeah, we can do all this stuff. You guys really want to know and understand the, everything from nuts to bolts about yes. the application, the business requires, not because the developer in this group would like, you know, a 30 minute retention and recovery. And this group wants 60 minutes. Oh, but yeah, our data sprawled all over everything. And, you know, kind of understanding the things you want to understand uh, going into a, each application and the value of those applications and the recovery. And not only, the actual like the data of residing it but what type of data do you want to recover versus a snapshot versus granular data and then you can come up with a solid plan to actually achieve these results yeah i think that's accurate and i <laughs> i think i think it really kind of boils down to bring you know putting that consultant hat back on is actually care you know just caring about you know what you're what you're actually doing right so i think Going in as a, say as a consulting and, and you know kind of looking at the environment, what they have and how they're doing things, you you know if you care you you're going to want to save them you know money and time and resources right because that's that's your job that's what you're getting paid to do and and sometimes it's easier to just say okay and just and and, and then just you know give me a check right as opposed to actually taking the time to know their environment, their data set, their priorities, you know, their recovering times and all the, you know, their SLAs and all that other good stuff. So I, I think, and in, in we've, as we kind of wrap up here, I want to pick on one thing that's important from the other side of it. You know, we've talked this, Jed, about your operator up. So you've moved into the vendor space and, and yeah. Vic, you know, you and I talked a lot and we've been around the vendor ecosystem, you even longer than me, and you've, you've done a lot in a lot of places and, and had a very profound effect on my understanding of like how to be effective as a vendor and where that customer consultant had all the time. And, you know, I've mad respect to you always and in, in how I've learned a lot from you over the years and watch how you interact. Your email address means less to me than your approach to things, right? Like we've changed companies over time sometimes, but this, the consultative approach how do you feel right now? Like being you've been here for a while and the cohesive D approach seems to really like, they like that. And I feel, is it how consultative can you get? And, and how do you feel about, you know, where the customers are and being able to say like, hey, we need help, not just to be sold a renewal license. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it stems from, you know, at one point I was in a customer space and had a lot of the challenges that Jed had. Uh, and then moving into a consulting role and then a technical account management role and then into a, a pre-sales role, right? And then a field CTO role. So you understand the various aspects of, of you know, the business, right? One is marketing, one is sales, one is, you know, support and one is professional services. Uh, but I come back to that because it's it's having being able to understand the customer first, right? I always go back to understanding the requirements, 
uh, much to the chagrins of my sales guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately. Well, and it's it's we, we you know we often joke too when people say like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm you know I'm a field CTO. I'm like, you're in sales. You know, I'm in technical <laughs> marketing. You're, you're in sales. sales. You know, <laughs> but it, it's it is it is important, and I think that we have this funny thing that we say, we try and say we're not in sales because we're technologists at heart. Yeah. And that's why even the, what we're doing here is like getting closer to the technologists in the end, we do know we've, we have numbers. We got to hit, we got quotas. The company has to do. Otherwise we don't get to do this stuff. But again, being able to bridge those, that line very well, you are among a few people I know that can do that where you, and Jed, you're already, I can see, you know, customer first, obviously you're going to carry the brand strongly and, and you look for the capabilities, but it's be customer obsessed. I think it's the kind of the, the, the theme. Man, I was yeah, actually going to a- quote that for yeah. AWS. <laughs> exactly. but I was, I was literally like, man, should I, I, I was just going to be like, listen, you guys sound like AWS leadership principles. Number one, customer obsession. So uh, thanks for touching yeah, on exactly. that. You're reading my mind. Like we actually work together. Cause I was going to say the same thing. Like it's very AWS. Uh, yeah, so we do. It's like we've done this before. So <laughs> we've been in, we've been at this for too long. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think one thing that definitely impresses me about Vic is is that he he does care, right? And and that's not something you see a lot, and not really in technology, right? Because again, you know, sales you got to be quotas and all these other things, which is new to me, right? In the vendor space, right? So you know, when you're an engineer or an administrator, it's a, it's a little easier to care. Because, <laughs> you know, your paycheck's not depending on, uh, you know, meeting, you know, your, your quarterly quotas and all that. Yeah, there's no like I, I, I didn't I didn't do 22 backups this week. So I'm I'm, you know, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm now on a performance improvement right. plan. Yeah, <laughs> we can handle that really quick. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Click that policy. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, you know, it again, it just comes down to. Being, being able to understand what a customer wants, right? Or, or what they actually need. Sometimes they don't even know what they need, right? You bring things up and now all of a sudden the, the wheels start turning and like, oh yeah, we didn't even consider that. But I think that brings value to them uh, and it and it sets up credibility. And then long-term, I think they're going to trust you as that, you know, a, a thought leader in that space. But yeah. you have to be honest. You have to be, you know, bring some value and, and solve some challenges that they may not have seen before. I think cohesity bringing in much more of that data security aspect is what folks are looking for. And you have, given today's threat landscape, you have to focus on data security because if, if that gets compromised and you have no effective way of recovering, you're going to be, you're going to be hurting, right? Business continuity goes right down the drain. Yeah. Yeah. Business continuity is far beyond just like, is it up or down? Yeah. It is truly that full, like it's it continuous security, you know, understanding, you know, as we move into hybrid environments, you know, where do we recover to? But ultimately, it's like, what happens if something just goes sideways right now? You know, even I used to have stuff where like I could do immediate, you know, near real time replication. And someone says, OK, so what happens, you know, if we have a, a virus that deletes stuff? I'm like, then we near real time delete the other destination. <laughs> too. Right. It's fantastic. You know, the near real time part works all the time. Like, yep. can is there a way you can stop that? Like, <laughs> well, no. No, but but we are at the point where we can do that. We can see those heuristic patterns. And again, what does it come down to? Visibility is cute. But if I don't have one single common place through which I can be a gateway to actionable outcomes and management, and like I said, the partner ecosystem and the humans behind it, it's uh, I'm a fan for sure of, of how you guys are doing it. Well, I also, also, I think it's part of, and I know we're, we're trying to wind down here, but uh, I think also a lot of the uh, AI and ML, right? right? Being able to detect anomalous behavior uh, that, that technology exists today. Um, so, uh, I'm looking forward to where that, uh, to seeing where that really goes now. Uh, I think building that kind of intelligence into a system is key, right? I mean, it, it, uh, eliminating a lot of the false positives. We heard false positives before, you know, people checking on, on these alerts that weren't really, you know, credible. And so being able to use a system that can detect that over time, is going to be very helpful for both IT ops, security operations. And I think I, what I would lastly say is that um, a trend that I'm happy to see over the past, you know, I'd say three to five years is that um, backups are no longer an afterthought. They're actually starting to refocus, you know, organizations are starting to refocus their budgets and understanding that, oh, wait, we kind of need this above all else or 
we might not exist as a company. And I think that trend, I hope, continues. <laughs> uh, a, because it's good for business. <laughs> it all comes down to basics and foundations. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Especially when we think of, you know, how many names end up in the news. And, you know, I would say even as my personal goal in life is to never be referred to as embattled or infamous, either of which tends to mean that something terrible happened that may or may not have been my direct cause. And and we see this, we have brand, you know, the brand importance of being safe, your data is safe, your recovery time is safe. People really recognize that because it happens now. Like I've I've seen environments that I know that they went through what would have been, you know, OG ransomware, you know, like botnets when stuff like Mirai <laughs> came out and that stuff, all of a sudden, like you, entire environments would shut down, but we didn't really hear about it. Now it is pervasive. It's going to be on Twitter by the time or Mastodon. Uh, I was by, saying, time, say, are you sure you, <laughs> by the time this comes out, are you quoting exactly. the right platform we're yeah. going to be talking on? Yeah. Twitter may be gone by the time this publishes, you know, tomorrow. We'll be back. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll all be back on MySpace. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, I'm with you on that one. Uh, I for well. Uh, I for Tom, one, welcome. My good. <laughs> I hope that Tom's still out there and still my friend. You know, he is laughing and he's like, man, I'm restarting this stuff and I'll sell it again. Why not? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so Jed, uh, where do we find you if people want to continue this conversation and want to hear what you're doing? Because we want to bring you up to, again, as a new voice in, in caring for what you did on the customer side. You are, uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can find me on the Twitterverse while it's still alive, uh, Jed Wallace 78, or you can find me on LinkedIn. And Mr. Vic. Virtual underscore Vic, if you're looking for me at Twitter, on Twitter. Um, I'm not recalling my Mastodon yeah. <laughs> right now. I'm sure it's some form of virtual Vic. That yep. is probably difficult for everybody to actually remember their Mastodon and what server they're on. And That's they're right. Spelling it out. I mean, don't get me wrong, but like I said, I have one and I can't spell it out. I, I'm going to do what you do, John, is put it on my uh, my Twitter profile. Hey, so isn't that, that unique? Like, hey, catch me over here if yeah, you're looking yeah. for me. So, well, or, or on LinkedIn as well. Yeah. I'm pretty accessible. It, it, and isn't it funny that we we all came from the spot, like even my morning run group is called still called v fit and you know like your virtual vic and i know so many people that are like v something or other and like but it's fu funny that we came from that environment and yet before that i was a, a windows active directory person and i oh, was an open stack person this, uh, i had like server 2000 but that was that was pre twitter handle i didn't have to you know have to pick a thing but it's funny that we will transcend this over time and the practices that we brought from that history it's fun to see it play out. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I'm, we're, we're, we're OG in a lot of ways, not just because Vic and I are kind of like the, the grandparents <laughs> of our community of, you know. Uh, disco here. Posse, Disco Biscuit. I <laughs> That's, it. That's it. And on the gravy. There you go. There you go. Well, John, anything you want to say in, in closing up here? Um, I, I was actually getting hungry. I mean, you guys are <laughs> talking about Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> Jeez. Look, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for joining us. This has been awesome. Uh, you are here at AWS reInvent 22 happening on the floor. By the way, I did capture some content. I'll share it. you some, uh, yes, yeah, some B-roll, by the way. Nice. We'll share it. I was, but they looked a little sideways at me like, what do you do? And then uh, we'll share it out to but this will make it out. What booth number are you at and how can people get out there? We are at booth uh, 425 yeah. and Jed and I and John, who's behind us, you may not see on camera right now, will be presenting at the booth uh, periodically throughout the week. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This has been awesome to have you guys here sharing your insights and stories. Uh, what's happening? A little nostalgia from Jed uh, <laughs> on it. It's like, <laughs> hey, you want to go singing after yeah. this? Man, we can wrap this up. We can, That's right. we can end the night on a good note. Karaoke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us. And of course, uh, for folks who do want to keep track of this and much more, make sure you go head over to gtmdelta.com forward slash live. We've got a lot more stuff that's coming up the rest of the week, and you can catch all the replays. And of course, follow Mr. John Meyer. Make sure you go to John Meyer. Uh, you know, it's, it's johnmeyer.com if you want to see everything from Meyer Media. And of course, go to cohesti.com. We get a lot of great stuff that's going on there. Great blogs, too. Uh, I got to give a shout out that it's much more than just what we do. And I, I love that approach again, you know, taking an agnostic approach and, you know, we, we call it thought leadership, but in the end, it's like actual practical skills that you can hand to a human and they appreciate it. And the net result is then they look, Hey, well, how can you help me solve this problem? 
well, you know, okay, now we're having a real conversation, but I love that. Start with first principles. What do we need to accomplish? And let's get it done. So there you go. Shout out to the Coisti team. And we'll see you all back on the stream. Don't forget, follow the Twitter uh, hashtag, if you're still on Twitter. Hashtag LV Reinvent 22. It's available uh, on LinkedIn. Just we've the already, we already did. So we, we will be on Mastodon, I'm sure, by the, by the morning. But uh, at any rate, it's great to be a part of this. And thank you all. Mm-hmm.